I have something from my heart to share with you. And uh, if you would stand with me this morning, I would like to read out of Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse 12. Next Sunday morning will be our New Year's Eve service, and we will be unveiling our theme for this coming year in 2018. And uh, you won't want to miss it next week. We will, I will be giving a prophetic word for what I believe that God is doing in the earth right now and what is happening and, and what the Spirit is saying. Uh, and so don't miss that next Sunday morning. But Hebrews 5 and 12 for when for the time you ought to be teachers ye have need that one teach you again which be the first principles of the oracles of God and are become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat let's just read on for everyone that uses milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. But strong meat belongs to them that are of full age. Somebody say full age. Even those who by reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. That's a sign of maturity right there. Spiritual maturity is when you have the ability to exercise your senses in maturity, not out of emotion, but in maturity to discern good and evil. Okay? Verse, chapter 6, verse 1. So he's talking about people who you shouldn't be needing a teacher right now. You should be moving on. But after all this time, when you should have matured and grew up and be able for meat now, you have need for somebody to come back and keep teaching you the, the same thing, the milk all over again. In chapter 6, verse 1, he says, therefore, or therefore, anytime there's a therefore in the Bible, you need to, need, you need to know what the therefore is there for. Amen. He's saying, so because of this, because you, some of you are babes in Christ, you require milk, you're not growing up, when you should be teachers yourself, you still need to be taught. You need to be reminded and secured constantly of things that you should already know by now. But then he goes on to say, strong meat belongs to them that are of full age, those who can discern spirit with their spiritual senses good and evil. And then he says, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on to perfection. If you walk into many apostolic churches today, you're going to hear the same message preached 30 different ways right. with 30 different titles, Amen. but the same milk every week. Right. And some people, it's like that they don't want more than that. They don't want to be challenged. They don't want, I'm telling you, it's about time some of us get our teeth in. Yeah. Yeah. He says this, is, so, so because of this, we need to leave the principles. That doesn't mean walk away from doctrine. That means build on it. Go beyond that. Don't, don't get so hung up on having to hear Acts 2.38 every week. Let us go on into perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God. Verse 2. Of the doctrine of baptisms, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, of eternal judgment. He's saying these are the, the foundational doctrines. He says, but we need to go beyond that. And this we will do if God permit. One more portion of scripture, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 1. 1 Corinthians 13 and 1, and then you can be seated and then I'll get started. 1 Corinthians 13, 1. Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels and have not love, charity, it's love, I am becoming as sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. How many of you have heard a lot about this time of the year, about charity? 
There's a lot of bell ringers outside of Kroger today. And I'm not speaking against that. We give to that, and I, we all should, to worthy charities. But he uses that word charity here, so I think it's befitting today. He said, if I speak with tongues of men and angels and have not love or charity, I am become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. In other words, he says, I'm just making noise. And though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all faith so that I could move, remove mountains and have no charity, I am nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not charity, it profiteth me nothing. Love is an action word. Verb. That's right. Verb. And he's about to explain to you how love behaves. Okay? This is descriptive words describing to us how you can identify the trademarks of love. This is the sign of spiritual maturity. Charity suffers long. In other words, it don't have a short fuse. Is kind. It envieth not, it vaunteth not itself, is not puffed up, does not behave itself unseemly, seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in truth, beareth all things, believeth all things, hopeth all things, endureth all things. Charity never fails. Well, if something never fails, what does that make it? Perfect, right? If charity never fails, if something, if you was to say, it, let's look at Jesus. Jesus never failed, right? He never sinned. What does that make him? Perfect, right? It makes him perfect. Charity never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, then that which is in part shall be done away. When I was a child, he's talking about spiritual maturity. I spake as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, and when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know even as also I am known. And now abideth faith, hope, and charity, these three, but the greatest of these is charity. Praise God. The title of my message today, Spiritual Maturity. Spiritual Maturity. And I'm going to be talking about this over the next few weeks, and I believe it's important and it's necessary. So open up your ears and engage me this morning. Say amen. Let's, let's engage one another. Uh, and and let's, let's glean something from this and let the Word of God change you. Let the Word of God change you this morning. You may be seated in Jesus' name. <clears throat> there are three types of people, okay? Natural, carnal, and spiritual. While the natural man is not born again, the carnal man is a believer, but is not spiritually mature. Y'all understand the difference between a natural man and a carnal man? You can be natural, and carnality, or the ways of the world, dog-eat-dog -dog world, is the law of the jungle, me, 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 is your modus operandi, okay? That's a natural person, a person who is unregenerate, a person who has not been born again, a person who does not know Christ, okay? But a carnal person can be a spirit-filled, born-again Christian who has just not come into spiritual maturity yet, and so even though their spirit's saved, their mind still acts, thinks, filters information, processes thought like the natural person. Amen. Wow. 
That's why many times carnal Christians are constantly within an internal conflict. Their spirit is saved, but their mind has not been yet. We are renewed in our mind day by day. It's not a one-time fix like your spirit is. Once you're born again of the spirit, you can't be born again and born again and born again and born again. Born again. How many times can you abort a baby and it be born again? I mean, the thing, the thing of it is, is once you've been born of the spirit, okay, your spirit has received eternal life. But the scripture says, be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may know what is that perfect and acceptable will of God. So a natural man is a person who is not saved. They can't receive the things of God. They don't think with a spiritual mind. They filter everything through the filter of a sinner's mentality, me, 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 the law of the jungle. Um, but a carnal person is a saved person who is not coming to spiritual maturity, and spirit is saved, but their mind isn't renewed. So they have this constant conflict and a struggle, and they're in and out of church, they're in, up and down spiritually, committed, then they're not committed, they're on fire, then they're not fi on fire. That is a battle that you have to win daily. And then, of course, there's the third person, which is a spiritual person. A spiritual person is someone who has come into spiritual maturity. They not only have their spirit saved, but their mind is daily renewed as well. And so their spirit and their mind, their saved spirit and their mind come into agreement because both of them, okay, are under the influence of God. The natural man is not born again. The carnal man is a believer, but here's the problem with the carnal man. He is still led, the carnal man, is still led by what he sees and feels. Everything to a carnal person hinges on how they feel that day. What kind of mood they're in. And their mood okay, of that day determines their behavior that day. It determines whether they're irritable, agitable, grouchy, rude, just kind of recluse to themselves. But as long as they're in a good mood, they're okay to be around and they're fun to talk to and they're enjoyable to be around. You ever met anybody that's kind of like a Jekyll and a Hyde? that their behavior is determined by their circumstances. I'm going to tell you the biggest and surest sign that you've come into spiritual maturity is when you can act, think, behave like Jesus no matter what your external circumstances are doing. Until you can get to the place to where you can have the fruit of the Spirit regardless of what your external circumstances are creating in your life that day, then you're a carnal Christian. A spiritual, mature Christian is someone's, someone whose external circumstances can be bad, negative, bad news, all kind of crazy stuff going on, but they still maintain an internal peace. Let me give you an example. Like Jesus when he was in the boat and the storm was raging and he was sleeping. Right? The storm, the external circumstances were raging around him. Thunder, lightning, rain. Everybody else in the boat was controlled. Their behavior, their attitude was controlled by what was going on around them. They're bailing water. They're trying to survive. They're trying to make sure they don't sink. And Jesus is sleeping. First off, I recognize one thing. The things that often bother us don't bother God at all. <laughs> and the things that we are trying to bail water just to stay afloat and keep our head above water are the very things that he can sleep through even though he don't sleep. But, but you see the symbolism. And so 
Jesus stands up. He says these infamous words where there's been songs written about it, there's been paintings drawn depicting it, where he steps up to the bow of the boat and he says, Peace, be still. And all of a sudden, the winds and seas obey him and everything calms down and the disciples were, wow, surely this is the Son of God. Even the, the external circumstances obey him. Even the winds and seas obey him. And they could not understand how it is, first off, that he could sleep through a storm that they were scared they were about to go under. And secondly, they couldn't figure out how he could stand up and speak to external circumstances and bring calm to it. And I think I have the answer. You cannot affect your external circumstances no more than what you already possess internally. If you have peace in you, then you can speak it out of you. But the problem is, is if you're in a chaotic situation and you don't have peace inside of you, you can't speak what you don't have. And see, the problem is, is if you don't have it internally, you can't affect it externally. The reason why Jesus could speak peace to the storm is because he had peace to give because peace was already on the inside of him. If you want to be a world changer and you want to be an agent of change, then you cannot allow what's going on around you affect you. You've got to remain full of peace even when everybody else is afraid they're about to go under. You cannot affect external circumstances if the storm that's outside is also raging inside. Amen. The reason why he could stop the storm on the outside is because the storm wasn't going on on his inside. Right. Too much of the time, that's the frustration. We can't change circumstances because we don't have inside of us you can't give what you don't have. And you can't speak into a chaos peace when you don't have peace. Jesus was the pattern son. He was the ultimate picture of spiritual maturity who knew how to sleep through what everybody else couldn't. And that's because his external circumstances did not dictate his internal condition. If you're the kind of person who bad news, bad reports, irritable co-workers breathing down your neck, gets you all worked up and controls how you act and think, then we have some spiritual maturing to go. We have some spiritual maturing to go. A person who is carnal is still led by what he sees and feels. If he fe People that are carnal are impulsory. If they feel an impulse to get mad, they just act on it. If they feel an impulse to complain, there's no register that checks their feelings and says, no, sit back down. There's nothing within them. It's, it's, it's a lacking of spiritual maturity. There's nothing within them when, when a desire to, to, wanna, uh, to, to, to be full of strife or to be full of uh, whatever. There's nothing that can stop that, check that, that tells that, no, sit back down. I'm not going to be dictated by what I see, hear, and feel. A carnal person is dictated by see, hear, taste, smell, and touch. How many of you ever seen somebody get all in an upheaval? How many of you have ever seen somebody get all up in turmoil, frustrated, and lose their day? And the first words you, when you ask them, why are you so upset? Why are you so troubled? Why are you so angry? Thank you. You know what they say? The first words out of their mouth. Well, I feel, there's a measuring stick right there. Or, I heard that, well, I saw, I seen him downtown, I saw this on Facebook, I heard somebody report this to me. 
and your internal peace is totally stripped away and you lose it all, all because of something you see, heard, taste, smell, or touch. Senses. Carnal. The carnal mind receives not the things of God. And everybody, when you use the term antichrist, everybody wants to think of some world leader with with a, a, a computer chip in his forehead or a tattoo on his forehead, and, 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 and that's how they, what they think of as Antichrist. But you know what the Bible says is Antichrist? If you say that you love your brother, but you don't show it, the carnal man is what is Antichrist. Any part of you that is not subjected or surrendered to the nature of Christ is against Christ. Anti means against. <laughs> and so the spirit of Antichrist rules and reigns when people adopt mindsets or patterns of thinking or behaviors that are against Christ. Wow. Wow. So, a carnal Christian has to make a decision to grow up or he or she must be taught how to come out of sin and to stay out of carnality. Many Christians, as Paul wrote in Hebrews 5, they should be spiritually mature. But he said, you're still spiritually babies. Your growth was stunted. He said, by now you should have been teachers but once again, you need to be taught the simplest things, one translation says. You've got to be taught again the simplest things about what God has said. You need milk instead of solid food. You understand that the Apostle Paul was not talking to baby or newborn Christians. The Apostle Paul was not talking to people that had just got saved. He was talking to people who had been for a while. He's writing to the church. He's writing to people who have been in the pew for a while. Who have been a member on the roll for a while. He's writing and talking to people who's already been baptized. Who's already been filled with the Holy Spirit. He's talking to people who have perhaps been involved in the choir. They've sung in the choir. They've been in the drama team. They've been in the sign team. They've been an elder. They've been a deacon. Whatever. And he's addressing Christians who have not come into spiritual maturity. He was basically speaking to believers who should have been more spiritually mature, but there wasn't. And I'm going to tell you, as you move from carnal to spiritual, you will start to have the knowledge of the Word so that you can teach others yourself. Can I tell you, everybody has to have a discipleship phase. Everybody has to have a period. And I want every person to know in this church, if there's any part of the Bible that you don't feel like you understand, I'm starting again this week. Uh, with someone else, a new discipleship course where we are going through the basics and learning the, the plan of salvation, the elementary things that, that are foundational and are necessary. And, and I want you all to know that's available to anybody. I don't want anybody to feel like they're slipping through the cracks. So I'm just wanting you to know that if you don't come to me and say, I need you to help me to understand this or I feel like I need a personal Bible study, then I am just assuming that you understand where we are, that you're at where you're at. Now, if you're not, then come to me. I'll be glad to sit down with you. I will take time to sit down with you. That's my job, one-on-one. -on -one. And we will go through the Word of God, and through a few lessons, you will understand the foundation of Christian living. So I want, first off, to make that available to any person here. That is for you. But there are some of us who have been disciples for 10, 15, 20, 30 years. And we know a whole lot. But for some reason, we've got to be reminded of it constantly or we forget it. And he said, you should be a teacher by now. 
But instead, you're still at a place where you need taught. The fundamental, elementary, foundational things. Paul dealt with spiritual, immature Christians also at the church of Corinth. He spent most of 1st and 2nd Corinthians dealing with carnal Christians. But it's also interesting to me that it was to the Corinthians, he had to write to them and say, Know ye not, the unrighteous shall not inherit the kingdom of God, neither the fornicator, the adulterer, the effeminate, blah, 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 shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And he goes on talking about how, the, the, how the, this one and that one, and you can't be an extortioner and you can't be a thief and all this stuff. But then in the same church, in the same book, he says, but I want to also address spiritual gifts. That's the church. Corinthians is also the same church where Paul writes extensively about spiritual gifts. Who would have thought that the most carnal church in the New Testament was also the ones who were the most spiritually gifted? Remember 1 Corinthians 12. He writes about spiritual giftings. 1 Corinthians 13. He says, though I speak with tongues of men and angels and have not love. Oftentimes, people make the mistake of thinking just because I speak in tongues, that makes me spiritually mature. I have met a lot of tongue-talking devils in my life who will talk in tongues on the altar and cut your throat out the back door. Huh? Huh? Because they have been mistaken to think that spiritual gifting equates with spiritual fruit. When we say the term spiritual fruit, when you think about trees producing fruit, you all know what I mean when I say that, that if, you, if, if a tree is producing apples, if that apple, when it starts to, to, to green and then turn red, what do you see? when you see that that's ready for picking, what do you call that fruit? It's, it's matured. Fruit is a sign of maturity. But unfortunately, especially in Pentecostal ranks, many people see my gifts. I can sing, I can preach, I can prophesy, I can heal the sick. Yeah, but what's your attitude like on Monday morning? Because our fruit is the measuring stick. Because what's in the fruit is in the root. And if your root isn't right, your fruit won't be right. Spiritual giftings are not a sign of spiritual maturity. Spiritual giftings don't do nothing but edify the church. It's not to edify you. I know a lot of people over the years who have been anointed and gifted to heal the sick and work miracles. There, there have been people who over the years, and I'm not pointing fingers and naming names, but there have been people who were incredibly powerful evangelists over the years who were known to be used mightily in the gifts of the Spirit and, and healing the sick and had great big tents filled full uh, of people who were coming and would leave healed of cancers and sickness but then get pulled over and have a DUI. Let's be real this morning. Because I'm going to tell you, you better make sure your fruit is more important than your gift. There's a reason why there's nine fruit and nine gifts of the Spirit. You want to know why there's nine fruit and nine gifts? The nine fruit are to balance out the nine gifts. Say you got the gift of healing, right? Right? Oh, I can heal the sick. Some people just have that. They have the ability to pray for people and they get well. What good is it to have the gift of healing if you don't have the fruit of meekness and you go around telling everybody how great you are? You've got to have nine fruit to balance out the nine gifts. If the fruit doesn't balance out the gifts... 
then you're going to be unbalanced. So Paul is talking to these Corinthians and he says, hey, I have spiritually fed you with the milk of God's word so that you could grow. But you get to a place to where milk don't satisfy you anymore. But I have come to realize there are some people, Brother Myers, that are happy staying on the bottle permanently. They don't grow, they don't go beyond, they don't mature, they don't increase in size. They don't even develop teeth to be able to chew the meat. Now I get it. Everybody in this room is on a different spiritual level. You've got to get that too, by the way. You know what's unfortunate about a church setting? The Bible requires it. We're supposed to forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. That's in the Word of God. We know that. You've got to have a pastor. We know that. But anybody remember back in the old days there were school houses? And in the same house... You had first graders with seniors. You had first graders, second graders, third graders, fifth graders, seventh graders, ninth graders, eleventh graders, all in the same schoolhouse. And that's kind of like, a, lot, a lot like how a church is. I have to get up every week and say something relevant to every first grader, spiritually speaking, every second grader, every kindergartner, every 8th grader, and every 12th grader. And if I don't give every single one of those age groups, spiritually speaking, a nugget, they'll walk away and say these words. I didn't get anything out of that. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. And, and so many people are get comfortable and content with only learning certain things or only learning, learning so much, only going so far. But you have to understand, this church is full of third graders, fourth graders, first graders, ninth graders, twelfth graders. We're all at different spiritual levels. No twelfth grader should be judging a third grader for not knowing what a twelfth grader should, by the way. So, so keep your tongue off of them. Don't criticize them if they don't get, I'll take care of it and God will take care of it. We'll get to that point. The ministry will, will bring them to that point. But you see, this is the challenge. It's not just getting up here. Preaching is far more than just getting up here and coming up. Some, anybody can come up with a thought. Anybody can come up with, wow, I just saw something in the Bible. I thought that was a pretty cool bit of information. I'd like to get up and preach and share that. And then they preach it two or three times. They're ready to pastor. Oh, Lord. Pastoring is far more than just being able to come up with a thought and, get up and getting up and preaching it every week. Getting up and speaking to everybody and ministering to them at their level. And at the same time, the hope is not just to keep them third graders forever. The hope is, is that they say, hey, I'm going to be a fourth grader, fifth grader, sixth grader, seventh grader, eighth grader. And when they get to senior, they say, hey, I'm ready to go beyond the elementary things. I want to go beyond that. I'm going to go to college now. And so there's some of you I can talk about things, deeper things that I can't talk about with all of the congregation. And that's not because you're not smart enough. It's just because you haven't got there yet. 1 Corinthians 3 and 1. If you'll bring that up, please. 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 1. And I, brethren, Paul says, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual. <laughs> He said, I wanted to talk to you on spiritual terms, but I couldn't. But as unto carnal, even unto the babes in Christ, I have fed you with milk and not with meat. For hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are you able. For ye are yet carnal. For as there is among you... <laughs> Ready for, he's about, he, what did he say to him? I wanted to talk to you about spiritual stuff. I wanted to help you grow. I've had to catch myself because 
I've, I've literally had to be adopt this frame of mind that I have to remember who I'm talking to in every situation. <laughs> some people, <clears throat> you got to prepare yourself. You walk up to some people, <clears throat> you have spiritual conversation, it's always edifying, uplifting. Some people, you know, oh, you know what's coming. They're going to give you their list of complaints and things that bother them. Yeah. And, now watch. You are yet carnal. And here's he's about to give you the symptoms. You ready for this? He's about to show you when somebody has not matured spiritually the evidence of that. For whereas there is among you envying and strife and divisions, are you not carnal? And walk as men? Wow. He's addressing people that have to have the milk. They cannot take the meat of the word. And he's saying to them, you are carnal. Here's the, here's the evidence that you are carnal. There's envying among you. There's strife. There's divisions. Are you not carnal? He's saying, wait a minute. This is just like people in the world. Th this is how sinners are. This is how your co-workers are. Bickering and fighting and full of strife and always got something. Are you all hearing me right now? And I looked up the Greek words that he uses here in verse 3. For ye are yet carnal... For whereas there is among you envying, that word envying means jealousy or emulation or indignation. And strife, that word strife is the Greek word eris. And it means a quarrel, contention, debate, variance. Hmm. I didn't say it. Paul said it. And divisions. That is the word dicostasia. And it means dissension, disunion, division, or sedition. And then he goes on. He says, so you're carnal. This is how, car this is how people are uh, at the factory. This is how people are uh, walking down. The, they're, it's like... Carnal Christians, their spirit is saved, but they think and act and behave like a natural man. They're in between. They've not matured. They filter everything through what they feel. Well, I just feel about it this way. <laughs> this is what I feel. This is what I see. And whatever they feel or whatever they see is always their reasoning for envying, strife, and division. Whatever it is that they feel like they've seen or that they've heard or that they feel is their justification for their strife and their divisions. And Paul says this is carnal because here's why. There are some things that are more important than what you are choosing to be divided over right. or envious over or full of debate over, full of strife over. What is more important? You see, th this is what religion... Do you want to know that the history of the world... 50% of all wars in human history, not American history, world history, approximately 50% of wars of human history, you know what they're based on? Religion. Religious differences. This is my side, here's the line. That's your side, here's the line. Let's battle it out. Instead of saying, there is something bigger and more important. See, here's the thing. 
I'm proving myself right right now because some of us right now don't have the teeth to even hear this. This is proving right now that this message is right. The teeth, okay, if you don't have the teeth, then it's going to be hard to chew the meat. And I'm trying to help us this morning to realize that in the end, love supersedes tongues. It supersedes debate. It supersedes any spiritual gifting. So I give my body to be burned. Anything that brings division, envy, and strife has not come under the spiritual maturity of love. Anything that is not governed by love will always be the thing that brings the battle. Now hang with me. I'm going to help us this morning. Stick with me for just a little while. There are some things that are bigger than what you're envious over or what you're contending over or fighting over. That's carnal characteristics. You take it up with Paul. This is what he said. For one saith, verse 4, I am of Paul. Here's what religious people do. You ready for this? They always claim or point to a person, a religious leader or figure, to identify with. This, this, is, what carnal, this is what carnality does. It creates sides. I am of Paul. The other one says, one saith, I am of Paul. And another, I am Apollos. And he says, are you not carnal? And people sometimes will pivot differences between Paul and Apollos. And, and Paul has a ministering style and he has differing ideas and how church administration, how things should go. I'm helping us. Let me pastor here this morning. Don't shut me down. I'm being more than a preacher right now. I'm being pastor and it's my job to help us to grow up spiritually. We cannot just say, well, Brother Paul represents what I think brother, better and Brother Apollos represents what you think better and let's set it down and debate. Debate, okay, you want to know the reason why debate is never productive? And I'm going to tell you something. I have even changed how I deal with Facebook. I'm going to tell you why. If you're trying to get somebody to see something biblically, I promise you, if I can't convince them in a sermon, you're not going to convince them in a Facebook post. There's only so much that can be said in 140 characters or whatever it is. All you tweeters out there. <laughs> That's what I found. It's, it's that there is a setting and a time and a place for everything. And I suddenly realized Paul is, he, he, I understand Paul's frustration. He's like, you're saying that, that you, you, you're behind Paul and you're saying you're behind Apollos and you think that this man of God and his view and his interpretation is more better than you think pa Apollos is better than Paul's and blah, blah, blah. And he says, are you not carnal? There's something more important than your petty divisions and emulations and envies. There's something more important. But a carnal mind doesn't see the more important thing. Verse 5, who then is Paul? And who is Apollos? But ministers by whom you believed, even as the Lord gave to every man, I have planted, Apollos watered, and God gave the increase. So then neither is he that planteth anything, neither he that watereth, but God that giveth the increase. Now, he that planteth, can I tell you something? Too many people, we associate ourselves with identity. I'm Apollos, I'm of Paul. Especially growing up in, in the Pentecostal church, we idolized certain preachers that we liked. They, they blessed us at a certain camp meeting. They blessed us at a certain convention. 
And so we kind of became followers of them. But the problem was, you see, we start to follow their personality more than we follow what God is saying. And then we get disappointed when we find par character flaws in them because we were following them more than what we were following what they were saying. And you know what's so credible? I can listen to any of the ministers in this church. Yeah. I can listen to Brother Newfarth. I can listen to Brother Tucker. I can listen to Brother uh, Myers. I can listen to Brother King. I can listen to Brother McClay. Any of the ministers in this church. And I can get something out of it. Yeah. And it's, well, that's not my favorite preacher. That doesn't matter. You know, I, you can listen to a donkey and hear God speak through his voice. You can listen to a, a Baptist minister, a Trinitarian minister, a, a Methodist minister. It don't matter what kind of denomination or belief system it is. And I promise you, if you're listening for the voice of God, you'll hear God say something in what they are saying. Now, sometimes some people throw the baby out with the bathwater. They throw the bone out with the chicken. Just eat the chicken, throw away the bone, but I promise you, you can hear the voice. Here's what you've got to learn to do. Like Paul said, it was a sign of spiritual maturity. You've took your senses to the point to where you're able to discern good and evil. Here's what you need to be able to do. I can hear the voice of God speak whether you're talking, whether you're talking, whether you're talking, whether you're talking, and I can learn to differentiate between your voice and his voice, what he's saying through you and what's coming from your intellect. Because God can speak through a child. He can speak through anybody. The question is, are you listening for the voice of God in anybody that speaks? And sometimes we get up and somebody gets up to speak and that's not our favorite speaker. You know what you need to do? Look past the face. Look past the personality. Even whether you like them or you don't like them. And say, all right, God, I'm listening for your voice and what they're saying. I'm listening for your voice and what they are saying. Speak, Lord. Thy servant heareth. I'm listening, God. To what you have to say. I would love to get to the place. To where we. You know not everything do we have to sit down and counsel through and debate through. In the end you cannot get 200 people together. And get them to agree on everything. And I'm going to tell you if you're going to require that. You won't go to church anywhere. But here's what we do agree on. There's power in the blood. There's power in Jesus' name in the water. There's power in the Holy Ghost. There's one God. <laughs> There's a trumpet going to sound real soon and a first fruits resurrection is going to rise up and rule and reign with him. Those are things we agree on. What I've learned is, is if I find out I see something different from you. Here's what I find out. I, find, I have made the choice. Let's talk about what we agree on and edify one another. And if I disagree with you or you disagree with me, at least you can hear me out and glean from something I'm saying. Wow, you know, I don't quite see it that way, but I really, I really respect that point of view. That, that's really he really brought some good points. And then same with you. I hear you out. I may not see it exactly that way, but that's okay. Some things are gray areas in the Word of God. There's some things we're not going to see or fully comprehend or know until we know in part right now, he said. We prophesy in part, but one day we'll understand it better by and by. And until we get there, let's stop bickering and fighting over gray areas. In the end, I have come to the realization we can become so dogmatic about gray areas. 
that we actually develop an identity. Well, that's what I think on that. That's not your identity, what you think on a gray area. A gray area don't have to be a hair splitter. A gray area don't have to split a church. A gray area don't have to divide friends. And if you get up and you speak something and you got the microphone and you have something to say and I may not fully understand it or agree with it, you know what? I'm going to say amen and support you because I'm coming into agreement with you, but that does not require me to come into agreement with every single thought that you ever go through your brain. I can come into agreement with you whether that means it does not mean because I come into agreement with you does not mean that I have to come into agreement with every blithering thought that goes through your skull. And guess what? I can get behind you. I can support you 2,000%. Here's the thing. Let's just pretend it, let's just pretend like we everything that we do know we agree on. If we spend enough time trying to talk about everything that we agree on, eventually we're going to find out there's something you see different than I do. What are we going to do then? What are we going to do then? You see, this, this is what religion does to people. This is why religion has produced 50% of the wars of human history. Everybody is more concerned about being heard more than they are willing to listen. You know, as the pastor of this church, obviously... I have the final say on the doctrines that are preached and taught here. But guess what? In the end, if you see something a certain way, and I don't quite see it that way, I can still support you 100% without committing to saying I support every blithering thought that goes through your head. You and your thoughts are totally different. I support you. Because even if you think you found somebody that you agree with on everything, hey, can you support your spouse and stay married to them? Would you agree with them on everything? Here, honey. <laughs> Just be lighthearted today. Everybody smile. Tis the season to be jolly. But see, here's the beautiful thing. You find two people. You find two identical twins. Find them. And you can go through every thought or belief that they have. And they may take them 10 hours, 12 hours. They grew up together, grew up in the same home, know each other. But eventually they're going to find something they don't see exactly eye to eye on. How religion does is it says, well, guess what? <laughs> really? Well, I can't be your sister anymore. That's what religion does. Love says, oh, well, I'm going to hear out your side because you have a right to feel that way. You have a right to think that, and then I'll share my side. And in the end, I may not even share my side because in the end, probably the gray area that we're differing over don't amount to a hill of beans anyway. I've come to find is that so much of the time you can find two people that say they agree on everything and eventually you'll find they'll find something they don't agree on but listen you can come into unity with people and it does not mean that you have to agree with them on it because see I get up here and, and, and on Fridays I spend two or more hours a week up here telling you everything I believe if you sit in this ministry long enough because we're all on a journey. I understand things now I didn't a year ago and two years ago. If I understand something now that I didn't understand two years ago, a critically immature person will say, well, he's changed. How can you trust his leadership when he's going back and forth? It's called learning.
That's what religion does too. It requires you to take a position on something and never be willing to learn or grow beyond it without being criticized as being double-minded or a waver. That's religion for you. But here's the thing. This Bible, okay, I didn't come in. I came into the world with nothing on me, and I'm going to leave with nothing on me. But anything that I have learned or gleaned from this, I don't just get up here and read a new book and then say, well, I've learned something new. I'm going to preach to you. No, 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 no. I ask God, give me a progressive revelation of your word. I want a, because you see, none of us can ever stand up at a certain point and say, I've got it all figured out. Listen to me. Nobody would say that, but everybody believes that. We believe things that we would never be dumb enough to say. I, life is about learning and growing. This Bible is progressive revelation. Somebody say progressive. That means you learn as you go. I got to hurry. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 5. I'm just about done. 1 Corinthians 1 and 5. Somebody say praise the Lord. This is good. This is challenging us, but sometimes we need that. In everything, ye are enriched by Him. In all utterance, in all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you, so that you, become, so that you come behind in no gift, waiting for the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. I like that. He says, so that you come behind short in no gift. These people were still in need of milk. But having spiritual gifts doesn't make you spiritually mature. Do you know what your spiritual maturity is demonstrated by? Not how loud you pray or how good you sing or how loud you snort ha, when you're preaching or, or, or how well you showboat when you lay hands. Lay hands on people. None of that is how you measure spiritual maturity. You want to know how you measure spiritual maturity? By how you make decisions in daily life in line with the Word of God. Not just, not, not just on how you're baptized or, or, or how you know if you're saved, but how I deal with a difference with someone. How I treat somebody walking down the street. Have I come into agreement with the Word of God? Am I being governed by love or by religion? Because love, you know what I come to find? Listen to me very carefully before you hear me say anything else today. I've read the words of Jesus and Paul, the two most prolific writers in the New Testament. And Jesus spoke about doctrine. Paul spoke about doctrine. But, but if you read the words of Jesus and Paul, you know what I've come to find that, Paul, that Jesus and Paul talk about more than anything else? Fruit. Not about religious rules. Not about how you do things. Not about church order. He addresses those things. But if you want to know what he, they talked about more than anything else, Jesus and Paul both talked about Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers. If you see a contention between two people, you don't step, get right in the middle of it and say, <laughs> you figure out a way to get the two to find common ground. Blessed are the pure in heart. The pure in spirit. Jesus talked about except you bear fruit. He talked about pruning fruit, pru pr pruning limbs. On and on and on. Jesus and Paul talked about the fruit 
of the Spirit more than they talked about anything else. <laughs> My last verse is in 1 Corinthians 11, I'm sorry, 1 Corinthians 13, verse 1, and I'll finish up. Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels and have not charity. It says charity, but I'll say love. I'm become a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. Though I speak with tongues of men and of angels and have not charity. He said, I am become. Let me tell you, that in Pentecost, that is the thing we look for the most. The initial sign of the infilling of the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And we want to speak it in tongues, speak it in tongues. We look for that, we look for that, we look for that, we watch for that, we listen for that. And, and I'm not against that. I, I mean, my goodness, I've laid hands on hundreds if not thousands of people in the last 18 years and seen them filled with the Holy Ghost. Speaking with tongues. But if that's where you stop and you don't grow beyond that and come into spiritual maturity, then uh, speaking in tongues without coming into spiritual maturity, let me show you and demonstrate just very quickly what it sounds like to God when you can speak in tongues. Okay? But you don't come into full maturity. Was that pretty annoying and loud? Good. I did good then. Because that's what Pentecostals sound like who speak in tongues with their rotten, sour attitudes and do not learn to govern their tongue or their attitude. I'm going to tell you something. You cannot get to the place to where you are known. You know, there are some people that are known. They'll warn you. And they'll say, hey, have you seen their bad attitude yet? What causes somebody? to get known for the propensity to have a rotten attitude. I'll tell you what's the product, what creates that. An emphasis on tongues, an external dress code, while the inward attitude and spirit goes to hell. It's never emphasized. It's never developed. In fact, a lot of these people, the people who taught them how to look, how to dress, and how to talk in tongues are the same people that won't even shake your hand or smile at you if you see them in Walmart. And the next time you think of someone who speaks in tongues but it's not coming to spiritual maturity, remember that sound and think about God. And though I have the gift of prophecy, verse 2, 1 Corinthians 13, 2, I understand all mysteries. Oh, everybody fights over what they do and don't understand. I understand this. You understand it this way. He says, if I understand all mysteries, who doesn't want to? And all knowledge, and I have faith, so that I could remove mountains and have no charity. I am nothing. Amen. What does that mean? You don't understand stuff that I do. I know what the Bible really says about this and how we should do this and how we should look and how we should do this and not go here. I understand all mysteries and I have all knowledge. No, but you don't have love. Then none of that other stuff 
matters at all. You know what the word charity is in these verses? He said, if I have all knowledge and understand all mysteries, but I don't have charity, I am nothing. You know what charity is? The Greek word agape. You know what it means? Affection or benevolence. A love feast. A love feast. A love feast full of affection and benevolence. What he's saying is, is if I understand mysteries and I understand the Bible this way or I understand this subject this way or I got a revelation on this and you don't, and we butt heads over it or we cross lines and battle lines and we differ over it and we allow it to cause problems, he says, None of that stuff matters. I don't care what I know. I don't care how much you know. If you understand things I don't or I understand things you don't. That don't that's not the biggest priority, even though we think it is. That's what we were taught. Oh, but you, you, you got to just know the truth. If you just know the truth, you got to stand for truth. Well, truth is a person before it was ever a precept. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. And guess what? God is love. And so here's the thing. My knowledge, if it's different from yours, or my understanding of mysteries, is not the most important thing. Because if, it doesn't, if I don't have love, none of that other stuff matters. None of it matters. This is why I said there is something that supersedes your right to be right. Your right to be right. There's something that supersedes that. There's something that supersedes even being right. Oh, we got the truth. You know that there's something that even supersedes Pentecostals of having the truth? It's having love. There's something because he clearly says, I don't care if you can move mountains. If you have so much faith, you can move mountains. If there's not a love feast of benevolence and charity between you and that other person, your knowledge and your faith means squat. All of your studying, nothing. Love even goes beyond knowing the truth. I need us to get that right now. Because we're the people that have touted over the years, we got the truth. Praise God, we got the truth. But many of us have not had love. And when you have truth and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, that's having truth, by the way. And you got great faith. And have not charity. I am nothing. In other words, if you don't have love that goes beyond. Love is the binder and the unifier even when differences of opinion when there's differences of opinion or your knowledge tells you something different from my knowledge or you understand a mystery different from how I, how I understand a mystery. Love <laughs> trumps all of it. This is the reason why you've seen over the years church splits. All of that, none of that was of God. That's the reason why I can tell you right now, if you ever have, if you ever known somebody or have in your past ever joined a church that was created off of a split off of another church, that church is doomed to fail. Because 
because God would never be behind any truth or idea or knowledge or mystery that may cause somebody else to go across town and start another church when love trumps all the knowledge and mysteries you could ever have or differ over. Boy, it's awful quiet in here, but it's true. Because I'm speaking to people who have all of our lives touted we got the truth. Well, we have some truth. We got a lot of good truths. But I can tell you some of the things that we have missed over the years as well. Love. Love is action. Well, well, what do you mean if I speak in tongues of angels and men and have not love? What does love look like if I understand all mysteries and know everything there is to know about the Bible and every subject and have faith that can move mountains and I don't have love? None of that counts. It's nothing. What is love? If I bestow all my goods to feed the poor and give my body to be burned, that, apparently that means you can give your body to be burned and bestow your goods to feed the poor and it not be done out of love. Because he says you can do one without the other. He said, though I bestow my goods to feed the poor. You know, some people do that not out of love, out of a tax write-off. Some people don't do that out of love. They do that out of recognition. Some people, whoa, like, if anybody was to give their body to be burned for their faith, oh my God, that's it's not necessarily love. Sometimes a religious spirit is so powerful. Because let me tell you, Christians aren't the only ones who have ever gave their body to be burned at the stake for their faith. You can be convinced of a religious persuasion and give your body to be burned or be a martyr and have not squat one bit to do with love. Don't you, don't, don't you like my grammar? Not one squat to do with love. Man. PhD showing through today. Hallelujah. But seriously, there are people that have gave their body to be burned. There are some people, they'll give money to donations to charities. It's not out of love. It's the fact that they get their name mentioned on the radio or the television. Hang with me just a minute. <laughs> Don't shut me down. Oh, I'm just standing for my faith. Bless God, I'm just going to stand for the truth while I bite everybody's head off and condemn everybody else to hell and treat you like you don't even matter. Be arrogant and cocky. But I'm standing for my faith. Oh, you're right. You're standing for your religion. Right or wrong. Stubbornness is not... Stubbornness is not the same as a made-up mind. I'm going to say that again. Stubbornness is not the same as having a made-up mind. So, if I give my body to be burned, bestow all my goods to feed the poor, it don't mean nothing without love. If I speak in tongues of men and angels, don't have love, well, what is love? If I understand all mysteries, if I understand this Bible verse, if I understand this subject, uh, and, and, and I don't have love, none of that matters. Well, then I better have love. I better have it, or nothing I'm doing even matters. What does it look like? Verse 4, 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Charity suffers long. It don't give up easily. It doesn't have a short fuse. It doesn't throw up its hands and say, I quit. It suffers long. It's not, see, long-suffering is not the same thing as patience. Patience is when you just wait time. Long-suffering is when you go through hell and keep waiting. Long-suffering. Love is a verb. Love is a verb. I'm describing to you what it looks like is kind. It's kind? Are you kind? Not just when you're in a good mood. Are you kind? I know a lot of people, you know, they say, well, we just need to have love for humankind. 
I'm not so sure if some humans are kind. Are you kind even if your body's in pain, even if you've had a bad day, even if you got a bad doctor's report, even if somebody's rubbing you the wrong way, even if somebody's pinching your last nerve? Are you kind? Charity envieth not. It's not jealous. Can't believe they got a new car, they got a new house, they're always getting asked to sing, they're always getting asked to preach. They're the pastor's pet. Charity don't behave that way. Love vaunteth not itself. It's not puffed up. Hmm. I'm going to flex my muscle and just show them how much I can pull strings around here. It doesn't do that. Does not behave itself unseemly. You know what that means? It doesn't act. It doesn't make a scene. You ever seen somebody? They feel empowered by making a scene. I've actually had people threaten me before. Well, you don't go do things my way or you don't do things this way or you don't do what I tell you to do, then I'll make a scene or I'll post on Facebook and I'll embarrass you. There are people like that, by the way. If you ever see somebody that would be willing to actually go public, take a private matter and go public with it and make a scene to disparage somebody else's character, you might as well just write them off for who they are. You might as well just write it down. This is a kind of person I don't even take seriously. This is a kind of person that's probably dealing with problems deeper than what they're saying is the issue. Okay, how about this one? Seeketh not her own, is not easily provoked, thinketh no evil, rejoices not in iniquity, rejoices in truth, beareth all things. Sometimes you got to bear things with a grin. How about this one? Wait, wait, wait. How about this one? Beareth all things. Believeth all things. Love doesn't look for a reason to discredit another ministry. Love doesn't say, well, I'm not so sure if those prophecies are real or not. Love doesn't act that way. They're showing spiritual immaturity. Love doesn't say, I'm not so sure if those miracles are, are really real. I mean, all those people haven't stayed that claimed that they were deaf and got their hearing. And it believeth all things. It doesn't feel the need to try to disprove things. If you see somebody acting that way, remember, they're not a mature Christian. They're not being governed by love. Love believeth all things. Somebody say amen. Hopeth all things. Endureth all things. Charity never fails, but whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, it shall vanish away. We know in part, we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect is come, that which is in part shall be done away. There have been denominations that have said over the years that this verse means that when the Bible was finally canonized, that that was the doing away with spiritual gifts. They think that which is perfect means when the Bible was canonized and made complete. So they say, well, when the Bible was canonized or complete or the apostolic age of the first century was over, tongues ceased. Well, there's a problem with that. If that's, if that's what that which is perfect has come is, and that caused tongues to cease, and that's why spiritual gifts are not for today, then I guess all knowledge has vanished away as well. But in fact, we know more technology now than we ever have. Because the same times tongues vanish, Cease, knowledge vanishes away. It's not the canonization of the Bible. What he's saying is charity never fails. But whether there be prophecies, they'll fail. Tongues, they'll cease. Knowledge will vanish away. But when that which is perfect is come, I believe that has a double meaning. I believe that's the glorified body that we get when Jesus comes. And I believe it's also love because he tells you what is perfect. What's he saying? 
quickly and then I'm closing. If you don't have love and you keep doing things in part, eventually you'll stop speaking in tongues because God will stop moving on you because you're not coming into maturity. Your tongue, I'm going to tell you something. Be very careful if you get to a place to where you start, pr you start praying and you don't get blessed like you used to. Because when tongues cease or knowledge vanishes away or prophecies fail, what's that a sign of? That's a sign that you're speaking in tongues and your knowledge is only in part. And because that which is perfect has not come, because it's not coupled with love, you're even going to lose the knowledge and the tongues as well. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether it's knowledge, it shall vanish away. Whether there be prophecies, they shall fail. But when that which is perfect is come, that which is done in part shall be done away. He's not saying when that which is perfect is come, all spiritual giftings will disappear. He's saying when that which is perfect is come, the behavior of people that talk in tongues and prophesy without love will vanish away. When perfect love comes, it actually gives meaning to tongues and giving your body to be burned and moving mountains with your faith and understanding all knowledge and all mysteries. Because without love and you just speak in tongues and you don't have love or spiritual maturity, you're incomplete. You're in part. You're in part. You know in part and you prophesy in part. Without love, eventually, your prophecies are going to stop. Your tongues are going to cease. God's going to withdraw Himself from you for a time until you are willing to repent and come into full spiritual maturity. Why? Because God will not allow you forever to prophesy, speak in tongues, and represent Him poorly in character. And if you keep going spiritually and you don't you keep doing it in part. You're talking in tongues, but you're mean and irritable and grouchy and debated and full of strife and bickering and fighting. Eventually, you'll even lose the tongues too. We know in part and we prophesy in part, but when that which is perfect has come, all the bad behavior that comes from people who talk in tongues and all that, See, that's what gives talking in tongues a bad name because they're doing it in part. They're speaking in tongues, but they still got a bad attitude. They're in part. They're prophesying, but, but they're critical and they got a bad spirit and they're not faithful. What's that? It's in part. When perfect love comes, the in part is done away. And all the bad behavior with it, you come into maturity. So that way you're not a tongue-talking grouch. You're a tongue talking full of love. You're a prophesying person full of love and compassion, feasting at the table of love. So, what's your prayer for the new year? Is it you get a new car, you get a new house, or you understand all mysteries, or prophesy, or no? Here's what we need to pray God, don't let me operate in part. But let that which never faileth, love never faileth. When that which is perfect, that which never fails comes, all of the petty, immature, childish behavior of Christian people that he spent the whole book of 1 Corinthians addressing will be put away. That's why he said, when I was a child, I spake as a child. But when I became a man, I put away the childish things. Tongues isn't the childish things. Prophecy and knowledge isn't the childish things. It's the behavior and the attitude with the tongue talkers that we're only doing it in part. And yes, ultimately, the fullest meaning of that is when Jesus comes, we'll no longer be doing this in part entirely. We'll understand all things and come into perfect knowledge and understanding. Let's stand all across this place today. I love you all. I know that, um, is it still snowing out? I, I can't tell if it is or not. 
Yes, it is. I hope that you have a great time with your families this weekend. Hey, how many will help me pray that you'll come into spiritual maturity? That's our, that ought to be all of our prayer. I don't want to prophesy and have knowledge and speak in tongues forever, only doing it in part. Have you ever felt like that you were missing something spiritually? No matter how much you spoke in tongues over your life, have you ever felt like you were missing something? Something's missing. I'm missing. I'm incomplete. It's because you did it in part. But when love comes, that's that which is perfect. And all of the bad behavior that comes from that partial in, in part will be done away with. And every knowledge and every gift that you have will actually matter now because without love, none of it matters. Shake hands and be friendly. I love you all. You're dismissed in Jesus' name.